Hi, everyone. It's been a while since I've just done a video. I've been doing audio for so long. Um, it is 7.36 a.m. Central Standard Time. 11.13.19? Question mark. I'm doing this today. It's first off. It's a good break for me. Uh, from the Bible in Obrey, which, by the way, I I know that the Bible in Obrey, it's uh, it is somewhat dry. It is in depth. Um, but the thing is, I'm really hoping that out there are yet some budding linguists who will catch on to to what I'm trying uh trying to show you now I came across um a book I search religiously for any kind of books especially the older the better on Hebrew and um I found some really interesting ones Getting the time to read them is issue one. Uh, the second one is I have found that with just all of them across the board, there are problems. There are assumptions. First off, I, I haven't come across one book yet. The, even w the, the last one I just started reading is by a French author, uh, written a few hundred years ago. And he has a lot of super valuable insights, but I haven't come across an author yet that didn't just have those same tired preconceptions uh, about well, just about about almost everything. The guy at the end of the book, he 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 translates. The first ten chapters of Genesis. So he just calls it the Sefer of Moses, which, um, fine, but that's only ten chapters of it. Um, you would think, I guess since it's only ten, he only got into the genealogies, but you would think he would know, especially the way that he approaches language, which is far more complete and... I think intelligent in certain ways than a lot of others that that I've I've seen. Um, you you would just think that for one thing he would realize that uh, Israel was in Mitzram, not Egypt, and there's other names of places and and types of inserted words that that are are popular in rabbinic literature and then have made it into our uh, modern Bibles that, uh, I don't know, I just thought he would be a little bit more savvy to. He's also in that school that believes that um, the Hebrews lost their language of Hebrew during their 70 years in Babylon. That's, that's another um, big wrong misconception that somehow Ezra the scribe changed things wrong wrong Ezra, Ezra and Nehemiah were both very zealous purists for the language the culture the obedience to Yahweh you name it they were zealous for this um, and not to mention the prophets after them were continuing to write in Obri. But besides for a lot of, of um, bad historical misconceptions and the fact that he just doesn't seem to know Scripture very well, and I found, I found the same problem with uh, the guy, what's his name, Oh, now I can't remember his first name. His last name was Yehuda, Jewish guy who wrote Hebrew is Greek, which it does have its uses too. 
The other author that I just mentioned, this French guy, I don't believe he is Jewish simply because of the way he approaches the subject of rabbis and rabbinic writings in a very in a very detached way. Okay, there there's nothing about his rhetoric that smacks as, as Philo Jewish at all. So that's interesting, and that's that's going to come into pl to play as I go. But these kind of materials and uh, the things that I do linguistically, um, I'm really hoping will provide some kind of foundation to to more for for them to get some kind of a a sense of all of the possibilities that exist within the record of the Bible. So hopefully that that is is what happens. That's the fruit of it. Um, but today, in this video, I'm going to do something different. Now, I did promise myself when I started writing the book, uh, tentatively titled um, The Geography of the Bible versus The Geography of the Ancient Near East, or maybe something shorter, I'm not sure. Um, the older the, you go with books, the longer the titles. It's just ridiculous. Um, but, you know, today I guess you have to keep it short and snappy because people have such bad attention spans. So I said, okay, well, I'm not going to talk about a lot of the, uh, the chapter topics and definitely don't want to give away some of the, the bigger things that I've put major hours of, of work and strain into. In fact, I am in the midst of uh, a particular topical chapter right now that has just about completely fried my brain and emotions. And I didn't think it was going to be easy going in, but it, now I'm completely convinced it's, it's not going to be easy. By the time I'm done with it, I will feel that I have accomplished something huge and I, I did feel that way after the few articles that I wrote and have published already at obreproject.info with each one of them because each one of them was was um, a lot of work um, but this is that in spades however even though I uh, promised myself that I did decide that some of the lesser points or loose ends, I would really like to make some extemporaneous videos about just perusing some things. Now, not all the things that I'll talk about or make these videos about are necessarily going to be part of direct topics in the book. Some of this stuff is just fall off. Maybe things that were a little bit too small or too brief, uh, something I couldn't wrap a chapter around or didn't fit very well with the material of, you know. So that's what I thought I would cover. I have on the screen, and yeah, this is, this is definitely more of a watcher than uh, a listener. I have a, a recent map on the screen of North America. So this map on the screen came from Google Earth. Now, what prompted this was not only fa the fact that I had to do a lot of writing and researching for the book that has to do with um, a little bit having to do with the Exodus, but a lot having to do with uh, Yom Sup and the great sea and place uh the placement of waters whether they be seas or lakes the definition of sea like what actually makes something a sea is it's not very clear um at least not that i've found you know can a can a bay 
be a C? Can a harbor be a C? Um, you know, basically, unless it's landlocked, all seas and oceans are connected, at least on the surface level. Uh, a lot of people believe that most of them are connected below the surface anyways. That may be, that may be very true, actually. But it's, it's hard to say what exactly is the definition of a sea. And, and the word in the Bible is yam. It's just ich em. And the crazy thing about it is... Well, that word that is uh, translated as sea, it, it is also translated as west. And, you know, the funny thing is, if you have a sea, so you have uh, Yum Emela, which is also called Yum Et Orbe. Now, it's along the eastern border of, I don't know if I, I don't know if I want to call it the promised land. I don't want to call it Israel because Israel's a people. You'll you'll see in the Bible you'll see Eretz Yisrael, you'll see Eretz Yuda, you know, you'll see Eretz Adum, Eretz Mitzrim. So yeah, a land occupied, but the thing about the land is the occupation of that land came with an agreement. And it was different than the covenants with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Those had to do with uh, something very long-term. It was a covenant that was one-sided. So, it didn't have anything to do, it wasn't dependent on what those men did in order for Yahweh to accomplish what he was going to do. It was just a one-sided covenant. The thing with living in the land. So we'll just say Canone because uh, it had been known as Canone for the longest time. And even in the time of Yusho, there were certainly areas of it that would still have to have been known as Canone, I would think. I mean, I definitely know that there was, uh, there was still territory known as Yuda. There di really didn't seem to be territory anymore known by any of the, uh, the northern tribes that were carried away long, long, long before. It seems like that most of the northern area just was given the name of Shamrun, the, the capital of the northern kingdom, which was changed First off, to the locals would have probably called it Shemeria, and then it got brought to us through Koine Greek and then the English Samaria. I think that was the the basic name of that area. But you know, by the time we start seeing the record of Yusho and his apostles, not that much about land is is talked about or described, and. Um, the guy who is recorded most in the New Testament is not in the land for a long time once they start recording his acts. So you, we don't get a lot there. Um, and, you know, I don't know, even if we did... I, I th I'm sure it would be beneficial. It, just the accounts of uh, his sailing to the places that he sailed to, those are very beneficial since uh, not even the weather seems to match up with what we know about the Mediterranean. However, so this would all have to be, I would I would have to say, New Testament, okay, so, I don't know. If you want to argue, you could say that Revelation might have been written one to two centuries uh, after the Gospels were written. I'm just saying, at, at most, 
there is a lot of argument, you know, over that. Um, the futurists are kind of stuck with keeping it pretty early. Um, and, and in that book, not much about the land seems to be said, at least not outright, not overtly. I do have suspicions that a lot is said about the land, the people, the coming back to the land, and our relationship with the rest of the world. I think all of that is covered in symbolic ways. There's a lot of other symbolic language that takes place in Revelation, and between the fact that it is written heavily, I, pe people who are experts in, in Koine Greek often will freely admit that the style of it is so odd or clunky that it seems to have very clearly been written in a Hebrew idiom and then translated into Greek, and it was a very clunky translation at that. Or, or they want to say that they think that the author was actually writing in Koine Greek and he was doing a very poor job because he was trying to match it up with Hebrew and Hebrew idioms. Um, whichever the case is, I, I do think there's a lot of uh, information concerning the people and the land which uh, are a focus of much of the Bible in Revelation, and I think a lot of that has been downplayed specifically because for the longest time throughout the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant Church, um, the idea of replacement theology has been the theology of the day. That's been the popular theology. In fact, acknowledging, like directly acknowledging that there, there was a, a very, very important role for genetic Israelites was not something that was really done much until somewhat recent dispensationalism. And for all of the faults of dispensationalism, at least that aspect of it is good. So backing up, I was thinking about the, the waters and, and where different waters are placed different seas are said to be. You have uh, the Great Sea, uh, which seems to be the entire western border. And you have Yom Sup, which certainly does seem to be south. And it would definitely have to border on... Uh, Mitzram, it definitely borders on Adum, Edom. You have Yam Emela, which is Yam Orabe, and it is to the east and somewhat south in the sense that it does, it, Judah's land does border on it. And then, of course, you have Yom Kanrut, which is a real strange one because it only shows up in six passages. And someone could, could almost argue that it, it appears more like Kanrut is, is, well, Kanrut is definitely a, um, an area, a region, or a land. Now, you can't argue that Yom Kanrut is a sea within that l larger, broader territory called Kunrut. Uh, but the thing is this idea that uh, Kunrut, which they say then became the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Tiberias, um, first off, the Galil and Yom Kunrut are not close together. 
the other thing is they say it got its name from a harp. They they translate canoe, um, which would be ka and air, as harp or lyre. I think mostly harp. And what they would say is that um, that actually that looks like they would say it looks like a harp. I've got. Uh, I'm going to zoom in. I've got this uh, sort of map of the Exodus from Egypt that somebody created. And you can see uh, what they say is, is Yom Kunrut is up here. And they say it looks like a harp. And um, y yeah, yeah, I, you know, if you use your imagination, it sure does. Um, a lot of lakes look like harps or or various musical instruments um the, this this really almost tiny pondish uh, body of water above it actually looks like a harp as well <laughs> so but anyways um now i'm thinking about all of that and then i'm thinking about placement where things have to be in relationship to each other and I remember that when I started looking at old maps of North America, that a lot of them from the 1500s, um, maybe even the 1400s and the 1600s, had California as an island. And now I, I punched that into a search just to see what... Um, the establishment had to say about that. And their explanation for the island of California was that the Spanish, who were um, said to be exploring North America first, had just made a, a big blunder and had assumed that what we call the Gulf of California today and the Baja Peninsula, that the Gulf went all the way through and that an island was created and they essentially mistaked that for that and everything. Well, there's some, some interesting things that I was just thinking about looking at some of these maps. Um, for instance, uh, this one here actually makes... California an island and it was done I'm sorry that map was 1656 um, if you think about it in 1656 they say that the oldest synagogue in the Americas was planted in Barbados of all places where the extremely lucrative sugar plantations were, where so many white Europeans were sent to die working those sugar plantations. That was around the 1640s, 1650s. Um, that They say that the earliest synagogue was planted here. And yet, I'll go back to the one, and yet there is so much detail on some of these maps not just detail in rivers they've tracked and landscapes that they've recorded, and not all of them are completely out of whack. I, I guess it would depend a little bit on uh, the individual or the empire that was making it and how poor their information is, or whether or not that map was specifically produced to deceive others. And it sounds to me like that was a common practice to produce maps and spread them around to deceive others. This was this was not a a weird thing. Um, this one is is the late 1600s, okay, and it still has uh, California as an island. Took me a minute to find the date on that. 1631. And this one is also got California as an island. 
And it wasn't just the Spanish who did this, who made this terrible mistake, I guess, if it was a mistake. The French did it as well. The French did it as well. Um, and the thing that strikes me, as I was saying, if they just made this a foolish mistake, um, I'm going to have to toggle back and forth to my most recent uh, North American map. Well, the other mistake they made, I think, was including a, a whole bunch of large islands that aren't there either, as well as, I got so many maps up, it's hard to toggle through, as well as them having a really poor sense of how far north they were. Now, a lot of these people had been sailing and traveling the world for a heck of a long time, but apparently they get really, really lost and really screwed up on the western side of North America. And one of the things that's so strange uh, about all of this and how they made such a great blunder uh, by making this major seaway here which, I mean, they also, it looks as though they have the Great Salt Lake with a river running from that to the sea. What's really weird about that is that Mercator in, yeah, I think it was 15, I think it was the 1550s, the, so the 1550s, um, so technically, if the story is correct, you know, people had only been just poking around the Americas and, and, and mostly just in the Caribbean for not even half a century, right? However, in the 1550s, Mercator is creating these very detailed maps that have a pretty darn good amount of accuracy in the Americas from what they call the North Pole. Specifically, he includes some bodies of water that you could say those are probably most definitely correct or close to correct bodies of water. And I have to... Uh, to check my other, like for instance, one of the lakes that he puts in there would appear to be Slave Lake. Um, he has Hudson Bay in there, and one of the other lakes might be, what is that other large lake in northern Canada, Big Big Bear Lake? Um, anyways, they, they seem to be pretty accurate at that time. So, just to think that nobody else would have the... Uh, the ability to create relatively accurate maps, I don't know. It seems a little bit hard to believe. Now, the reason I say this is because the other thing that I know a lot of people are sort of catching on to is that um, there appears to be cycles that the world kind of endures with uh, warmer climates for centuries and and then colder climates for centuries and um, around the time that some of these maps were made it, it seems like there might have been a much warmer climate for some time now I I don't really think that the climate is, is um, really dictated uh, necessarily by the sun. Uh, anybody who has observed uh, the sun and the way that it warms and how you can be in the midst of the most brutal winter and have the sun full up in the sky, unobstructed, would know that it's, it's not necessarily the sun. But there does appear to be evidence that there are really heavy cycles 
uh, that seem to phase back and forth. So if this is the case, and if a great amount of the water um, from these cycles, if it's a, a much warmer cycle, or let's just say over long periods of time that, that, that uh, worldwide cooling has taken place, um, incrementally, bit by bit, bit by bit. You, some might remember when uh, Chip Wilman came on, he said that they believe that California was rising uh, a certain amount each century. Well, is that the case, or has the water just been going down? Now, if that's true, and the water has been receding little by little, little by little, over time, then you go back even a thousand years and I would think that a lot more of even Palestine would be underwater. Not saying all of it, but it would definitely change the face of that place quite a bit too, I would think. Now this is, this is what they're seeing, what, 500 years ago, four or 500 years ago. This is what they're saying they're seeing. And it's so detailed, there's so many places they have named all along the West Coast and in Mexico um, that that kind of excuse, it just, doesn't, it just doesn't wash. Now, the reason I brought that up is because, so we look at America now, and maybe a lot of the people that have listened to the presentations or read the articles that I've written, uh, the patriarchs, their livestock in the land, the land of Amory and Euphrates, a problem of geography. They might listen to that and then they might go and look at North America and think, well, that's just, there's just no way. Um, and if they, if they know Bible geography, if they're, if they're studying it hard enough instead of just what happens is we get that Middle Eastern map stuck in our head because they stick them like in every Bible in the back. You know, we just can't seem to get away from them. But if you're, you're really studying your Bible and you think, well, I just don't understand how exactly that could work. Well, there are ways that it could work. All you would need... I don't think you need necessarily um, major geological events happening in North America, although they very well could have. And in fact, some of the language of Revelation, uh, as much as people want to turn so much of it into symbolism, a lot of that language could actually be realism with only other portions being symbolic. It's really hard to say. Um, none of the systems I've heard, historicism, preterism, futurism, idealism, none of them really work. They work a little. They all have relatively good ideas. They do. But when you think about it, for instance, Revelation mentions earthquakes five, six times at least. Maybe more. Revelation mentions a number of natural disasters. What we would call natural disasters today. Disasters. And the odd thing is that, well, because we've got this replacement theory kind of mindset, we've had it for many, many centuries. Who knows how long? Uh, then there's this tendency to start out the book thinking that we're, we're in a completely different place. Oh, and what I mean by that is, even for those people that believe these events occurred in and around Palestine, Middle East, Levant, even they would oftentimes believe that this was just happening in a different place. They would believe that sort of everything has moved. The... 
from Palestine to, let's say, the lower Mediterranean. So Italy and Greece and Turkey. And then it would just sort of spread through Europe. So they believe that all of the Old Testament, for the most part, is happening in the Levant. And that mostly the New Testament is happening in Europe and America. Now, their system that they have, it works pretty well. And that's the thing about systems. You work on a system long enough, and you can make just about any system work. That's kind of the problems with systems. That's why I'm so leery of systematic theology. Um, however, n none of those eschatologies really work. None of them are, are watertight. So, with America, now, the first thing is, none of the people who would speculate on the condition of North America or North and South America for however many years they want to speculate on the condition or the state of it, were here. And apparently, if... Um, since they say we don't have any records of the place and um, no sailor the world over seemed to just to, to bump into the place, even though they, they will admit now from time to time, well, you know, we do believe that maybe the Norsemen came here. Um, we can't really explain all of those massive tons of very special kind of copper that just disappeared from uh, the Lake Michigan area what didn't just disappear it was it was intelligently mined away from there they can't explain a lot of things and they definitely don't want to explain why they bar so many potentially wealthy archaeological sites in North America there's a lot they don't want to talk about. And we know just from their tactics concerning um, talking about their faking of space and talking about their faking of the European World War II Holocaust. Whenever it comes to them faking or covering up or lying, the tactic is not to debate. The, the tactic is to make whoever asks questions about these things look crazy or stupid or uninformed or, you know, they'll point to books or lectures by any number of their shills. And I don't know why anybody trusts any academics anymore, especially when you hear all of the the crap about how many academics Jeffrey Epstein was blackmailing. And that, that's just one guy. You know that if he was blackmailing a number of academics, they have academics in their crosshairs and have for a long time. Why? Because they know that so many people will commit that logical fallacy of appealing to authority. And they'll go right to the academics and NASA, so on and so forth. So what I did was, I, I just took a modern image of North America from Google Earth. And, and then considering things like the geography of the Great Basin, for one. The fact that just Death Valley alone is somewhere two to three hundred feet below sea level. Now, that's today's sea level, people. I, you got to think about that for a second. With the potential size of Antarctica and with the potential size of the Arctic, and we don't necessarily know the size of these places, and how much ice these places would have had to have gathered uh, d depending on water levels 
and that sort of thing. We, we don't really know how high the water levels could have been, which of course changes something. You know, if we have a gauge for sea level and you bring the level of the sea up, then your gauge for sea level, as it is today, changes because then it makes it lower if the sea is higher then it's further below sea level or if it was if it was a place that's only maybe a hundred feet above sea level and sea level rose a hundred feet then yes it's at sea level now these kind of changes can make a, a drastic difference in the way that rivers run um, there are many rivers that were probably under seas at one time or another. Uh, we don't even have to talk to talk about all the um, face changing that the Army Corps of Engineers, which was in existence before even the Constitution was, has done to the United States, specifically probably the Western United States, um, or all of the agents that were sent out in the western United States in large groups of people to do all kinds of projects that just never really got written down. But besides that, when you consider the, the topography of America, for one thing, just as it stands today, and then you consider the fact that you don't know exactly what the topography was a thousand years ago because if there were a number of geological sort of disasters that happen it can really change a place and you know there's one thing about the specifically the western United States it is a crazy weird looking place the topography of it is crazy weird looking so what I did was I just uh, sampled the near ocean blue and I tried some fill-ins. So for anybody who's watching this, or if you've got the phone in your pocket, you're not watching, you're listening, take a second and just look at, at your phone or your computer because I'm going to show you just some, some variables concerning the way that the sea could have looked once upon a time. Here's the first one. And this extends a relatively small sea, just right up into the Death Valley area and a little bit more north into southern Nevada, brings it across to the tip of southern Nevada and then pretty much down the west side of New Mexico. All I did was extend the Gulf of California a little bit. All right, that was like the most, uh, the most conservative exercise I tried. Now, number two, I went ahead and put in what I think is a more conservative estimate than what I've seen from, I think, some of the jokers, because I think they, may, they want it to look like a joke for some reason. I don't know why. Um, when they talk about the, um, oh, what do they call it? the Western Interior Seaway. I couldn't remember it for a second. So there's this idea, and of course they'll say it was it was back so long ago that plesiosaurs were swimming around in it and dinosaurs were roaming everywhere. But some think that because of the elevation and, you know, the possibility for geological factors, maybe a higher water level, that there was a great interior sea. Now what I think was is that there was a great massive flood at a point. However, what's interesting about this idea, this this great sea, and now some, some people think that it possibly would have extended to Lake Superior and up to Hudson Bay, and it just would have pretty much like bifurcated North America. Now, yeah, what's so interesting about that is that um, had that done that, we don't exactly know what the topography would, would have been like on the eastern side of it. Um, however, it 
it might account a little bit for why we find so, well, we don't, farmers have found so many artifacts with, I'm going to say more of an Aramee character and even Obri characters, just small artifacts all over here. Now, don't get me wrong, they, they've also found, for instance, there's the Los Lunas stone, and that's in New Mexico. And the thing is, there are so many names of, uh, of places, areas, and peoples in the western United States that smack so, so, so heavily of Obri that it's it's kind of for for me it's kind of hard to separate the two unless you realize that there's just such a strong possibility that before the languages were schismed at the tower of babel that everybody spoke in the land remember the bible especially throughout the old testament is talking specifically about a particular land and focusing on a particular people. So, I think it's just highly likely that just about everybody on this particular land spoke the same language, and therefore the artifacts would have been quite similar. Now, the other thing is that there was probably plenty of travel back and forth, even after the Noadic Flood which would account for that as well. And, you know, I haven't even looked into all of the artifacts that have been found in other states all over the place. It's not the easiest thing in the world to find material on that stuff. Um, those books, you know, they're not heavily publicized. They're not talked about. Um, and sometimes you got to find information like that in some really obscure places. This is stuff that, that, if not entirely covered up, definitely marginalized. Definitely been given the silent treatment. All right, now, number three, I tried a sea that actually covered up more of the Great Basin and just played around a little bit with um, areas west of there. So they would have been a little bit west of the Rockies, um, just depending. And the thing is, you know, you can look at it on my screen, and because I picked such a, a close color to what they typically show on Google Earth right near the shoreline, which would be the shallower parts of the, the ocean, hopefully you can get a re really good idea of, I mean, just how drastically that would have changed the land just to do that. And and here's the thing. If you had, you look at Mexico, even just today, and and there are these these various areas of, of broad, flat lands. Um, this whole peninsula between North America and South America may not have existed not all that long ago, which then would make a lot of sense concerning why Shalmei Solomon put his merchant fleet in Yam Sup, which was to the south in the land of Adum. Um, I did try one more, which is somewhat similar. And again, as you can see, um, if there was a seaway that went through Mexico, and who knows, even cut it off. I've still got the, uh, I think I still have the paintbrush. Oh, I can't do it right now, I guess. Um, I was almost going to just take a paintbrush and just kind of wipe right through there. You know, mountains can come up pretty fast. Geological events that radically change the topography of a landscape can happen so fast. It's not even funny. It's not even funny. Um, guys like Kent Hovind use, um, like the Mount St. Helens eruption 
to illustrate that. Just how fast the character, the landscape, the topography of a place can be changed in a really, really short amount of time. So I'm just trying to illustrate to you how different a place North America could would could have once been. Um, and you know, just in the in the boundaries of California, the state of California today, um, I can't remember. You could you could fit today. Um, make sure I got this right. Twenty. Palestines, just in the California of today. That's one thing that's that's a little bit hard to grasp sometimes, is when we end up having to look at a map like this. Okay, this again, this is a, this is a really ridiculous uh, map of the assumed journey of the Exodus over in the Middle East and Levant, the area of, of Egypt, Sinai, and Palestine. And just kind of wrap your head around that. The, um, the borders of Palestine, so from the north here, you would have, um, I mean, not very far north of, I guess today it's the Sea of Galilee. Then you go out to the sea, and that's only about 24, 25 miles and then you got to come down here. Uh, you'll stop short of what they... I love this on these maps. They always do this on these maps. It's so devious, and it's deceptive. They put like the Wadi, the Wadi of Egypt, as if that was the Shehur. Ner Mitzrim. Ner. Nothing gets called a Ner that isn't a big river and they'll put it in blue and they'll they'll make it just as pronounced as as any other river around here that's just ridiculous anyway so right down about here and then you'd have to take uh, a hard southeast to um the gulf of aqaba and then basically come up at you know north uh by northwest to the dead sea and that's that is the area of Palestine, Israel. And that's only, it's under 8,000 square miles. That is under 8,000 square miles here. You got to appreciate this. It's not big. I'm not saying it's like uber tiny, but based on the things that had to occur here, based on the sheer amount of civilizations that had to live here at once, based on the amount of cities that there were in the territory that just the tribe of Judah conquered, based on the fact that Yahweh said there were seven nations living in the land when they were about to come in. And that is from the Yarden West word. Seven nations that were larger and greater than Yisrael was at that time. And they had to be at least a few million strong at that time. Now, when you think about how the population's over there right now, They'll tell you, they'll give you numbers like that there's about 6 million Jews and 6 million Arabs, right? But you, you consider how much pumping that they do out of uh, the Lake of Galilee and the, the Jordan and then what they've got to do um, out of the Mediterranean and all they're trying to purify to provide water and then consider that 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 Palestinian population that they're talking about, they only give them running water three days a week. And they are massively pumping water out of these places just to try to sustain that population. And Jordan is doing the same thing. They have to share water, basically. They're taking all kinds of water, too. And you tell me, 
how such large, large populations were sustained water-wise, their cattle-wise. We're not talking large populations like the supposed, I love it too, six million, they six million Jews and six million Arabs, they'll tell you. And we see how much they're pulling like crazy out of here. They can't, they can't grow enough here to, to feed the, the cattle because they, they have, they have these dairy farms there because they want to look like such a great exporter. Now, Palestine exported at one time. They exported olive oil and nuts and a few other things. They definitely exported when it was Palestine. Not a, not a lot, but they did okay for themselves. And it wasn't a gigantic population. The country was big enough for the people that lived there. And it provided for the people that lived there. There wasn't any, anything unnatural or inorganic going on. But you guys, you don't seem to understand the, the, the size of the populations of these places. These peoples. Kush marched a million-man army. There was a battle in Shomron, around Shomron, the, the northern kingdom that claimed a thousand, no, sorry, that claimed a hundred thousand men in one day. These are extremely big populations. This is a place being described that has many natural resources, abundant natural resources. It's not, that's not Palestine. Palestine's never known to have abundant natural resources. And I'm not, I'm not picking on Palestine. Um, it is, it is what it is. And it was, um, you know, apparently just a, a good small country with mostly agrarian peoples small herds of animals, um, olive farms, fruit farms, um, and that land sustained them. And it wasn't a huge population. It did They did fine. And it was well balanced. There's simply no friggin' way that that land could support the sort of populations described in the Bible. Not a chance. Just not a chance. And, um, you know, everybody's going to have to pony up and explain the anomaly of the Americas just completely missing from the record until, what, the 1400s? That's that's one of the stupidest things I've ever heard. I guarantee that that ranks up super high in one of the stupidest, dumbest things I've ever heard. That nobody just really knew about America until around the 14 to 1500s when Columbus went and bumped into it. That's so stupid, dumb, idiotic. And here's the thing, in such a small time, you know, you have these maps uh, made in the 1500s, the early 1600s. Whoa, they must have really been getting around too. Because even if they made a mistake and made California an island and it wasn't supposed to be, <laughs> they sure did spend a heck of a lot of time naming the crap out of this place. And not only naming it, like I said, they, they have, they may not be in the perfect place or, you know, they may not be able to take those satellite pictures from space <laughs> uh, like Google Earth can, but they had river systems charted, named pretty darn far inland, not just on the East Coast, 
um, the East Coast, far up into Canada, all the way down the East Coast, around Florida, Mexico, Guatemala, um, all the way through to South America. South America, massively named. The rivers, massively charted. And then follow it up all the way on the West Coast. Mexico, all the way on up. In a very short amount of time now. The thing is, there's not these huge accounts of prolific amounts of explorers uh, coming here, even in the 1500s. And if those accounts are correct, a lot of them saw some, some really insane things when they first came here. Um, like, for instance, the giants. They saw so many giants all over the place in different Indian tribes. They saw a lot of crazy things over here. Um, but yet I guess that enough of them are traveling far enough inland to be mapping out these rivers, um, naming a lot of these places, um, mapping out, placing mountains and other things. Because to me, it seems like there were maps around. There were maps around. And um, I absolutely believe that when Columbus headed this way, he had maps. He had maps. He had maps. This whole idea of looking for the the West Indies. He knew what he was doing. They knew what they were doing. Those crypto Jews that were running that operation, they knew what they were doing. And the idea that so much developed in such a little time, especially when we're willing to believe that the Spanish were so stupid that they thought that the Gulf of, of Mexico and the uh, Baja Peninsula were were an island and that the sea went all the way through they're so stupid but they got so much done in such a small amount of time those idiots it's just another idiotic story from a bunch of just incapable that people who are incapable of telling the truth about anything well because if they do Maybe we'll find out the truth about everything. And that's what they're afraid of. Now, I did think this was great. I just want to leave you with this. Is uh, when Mercator produced these maps of his in the 1500s, in the early 1600s, because he produced a number of editions of them, of the so-called North Pole. They knew what the name of this place was back then. And what did they call it? What did Mercator call it way back then? Amory. See you next time.